Hello everyone, my name is Catherine Bennett. I am the Head of Marketing and Communications for the Institutional Healthcare Business at EBOS Group. Welcome to HPS Pharmacy's webcast lecture. This educational presentation can be used to contribute to your CPD hours to meet the standards set for professional registration purposes. We are recording this lecture for on-demand playback. This lecture is a pre-recorded session. The slides will also be available by emailing us following the event. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, John Wilkes. John is a clinical pharmacist and accredited consultant pharmacist at HPS Pharmacies Norwest and Campbelltown Private Hospitals. Today, John will be discussing the use of direct acting oral anticoagulants in the morbidly obese. This pre recorded event will be accessible by clicking on a direct link, which you would have received in your email. If you have any questions, please email our speaker. We will provide those details on the website. We hope that you enjoy this presentation and find it useful in your practice. I will now hand over to John. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, as noted, today's presentation is on the treating of obese patients with VTE using direct acting oral anticoagulant drugs. Noting that VTE is comprised of pulmonary embolisms plus or minus deep venous thrombosis. Obesity is defined by the WHO as a BMI of more than 30, and obesity is stratified into three categories. Class 1 includes persons with a BMI of 30 to 34.99 kilograms per metre squared. Obese class 2 includes a BMI of 35 to 39.99, and obese class 3 is a BMI of 40 kilograms per meter squared or greater. As can be seen in this slide, in 2015, 28% of males and 30% and 27% of females were deemed to be obese. In Australia by 2025, approximately 83% of males and 75% of females aged 20 or over will be obese or overweight. Does obesity matter? Yes, obesity is associated with a 6.2 fold increased risk of venous thromboembolism with the highest risk among those aged greater than 50 years and those in classes two or three of obesity. Therefore, it is surprising that there is a lack of data on dose adjustments for DOACs in this population subgroup. There is also an apparent lack of consistency between injections and oral dosing of anticoagulants. When we dose a VTE drug such as anoxaparin, there are two physiological factors which are assessed, renal function and body weight. However, only renal function is considered when dosing with oral factor XA inhibitors, such as rivaroxaban, apixaban, or the direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran. Weight is not considered. Should we be concerned about this apparent lack of inconsistency? Let us consider some important pharmacokinetic principles the volume of distribution and drug clearance. The elimination half-life depends on the volume of distribution, VD, of a drug and the clearance, CL. Clearance, as noted earlier, is a factor taken into account in the dosing of DOAC drugs. Volume of distribution relates to the BMI. A higher BMI is associated with a higher level of adipose tissue. Changes in the volume of distribution would be expected to have an influence on the half-life of a drug in obese patients. A drug with a high VD has a tendency to move into the extravascular components of the body 
meaning that a higher dose of the drug may be needed to achieve a given plasma concentration. Conversely, a low VD means that a lower dose of a drug may be required. As can be seen in the next overhead, the bigger tran has a VD of 50 to 70 litres, rivaroxaban has a VD of 50 litres, and apixaban has a VD of 21 litres. As an important aside, anoxaparin has a VD of approximately six litres. So does the research tell us much about the use of DOAX in obese patients? Much of the available clinical outcome data in obese patients comes from pre-specified subgroup analysis of the phase three trials that demonstrate the safety and efficacy of DOAX compared to VKA drugs. No large scale RCTs have specifically investigated the efficacy and safety of DOAX in the obese population. In the absence of random control trials, pharmacokinetic studies have supplemented data by providing insights into the effect of body weight on plasma drug concentrations, expected drug exposure and half-life. How clinically significant is weight when dosing with DOAX? Dabigatran. Most of the data on dabigatran use as an antithrombotic drug comes as extrapolations from trials such as RELY, Recover 1 and 2, Remedy, and Resonate. In Recovery 1 and 2, the BMI range was 28.4 plus or minus 5.8 kilograms per meter squared. This is a BMI range in obesity class two, which is not the highest level of obesity and hence provides no direct beneficial evidence. Nonetheless, some insights were gained from a subgroup analysis of the Bigotran peak and trough concentrations within the RELY trial which demonstrated an inverse relationship between trough concentrations and weight. Apixaban. For apixaban, the research has shown that in patients weighing greater than 120 kilograms, there was a statistically significant decrease rate of change in anti-factor XA levels. Further, the area under the curve for apixaban anti-factor XA levels was significantly lower in patients over 120 kilograms. Whilst the mean half-life of apixaban was 8.8 hours in the high body weight group, as compared to 12 hours in the reference group, this difference was deemed unlikely to be clinical. Rivaroxaban. Research into rivaroxaban in obesity has reported no difference in rivaroxaban levels for two groups of patients on 20 milligrams daily and are weighing 50 to 120 kilograms or more than 120 kilograms. Also, rates of bleeding or recurrent thrombosis at 12 to 18 weeks were not affected by extremes of body weight. So is all of this merely theoretical? Consider this case study. This study involves the use of the Bigotran and the development of ischemic stroke in an obese patient. The 48-year-old male had a body mass index of 44.7 and a weight of 153 kilograms, clearly placing him in obesity class three. He was admitted to hospital with a right hemispheric stroke. He had a long-standing history of hypertension hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, and paroxysmal atrial flutter. He was also a smoker. He had switched from a VKA to dabigatran four weeks before hospital presentation, and he reported good medication compliance. Having taken the last dose of dabigatran nine hours before the onset of the stroke. An immediate measure of the plasma level of the Bigotran returned a value of zero nanograms per milliliter. 
The Bicatran was continued, and after three days of observed administration, the plasma level of the Bicatran was measured before the drug was re-given, and then every two hours thereafter. A peak level of 50 nanograms per mil was reached four hours after the drug was given. Because this level was below the 25th percentile of the therapeutic trough level for the Bicatran, the patient was switched back to a VKA. Clearly, a key feature in the failure of the Bicatran was the patient's high body mass index. Compliance may have also been a contributing factor. So what is the role of the pharmacist in this case study and the use of DOAX in the obese? First, there is adherence assessment and counselling, which are vital. For example, rivaroxaban should be taken with food for optimal absorption. The bigotran should be, not be opened, crushed or chewed, and the dose should be taken 12 hours apart. Exposure to air results in the capsules absorbing air moisture due to their hydroscopic properties. This can diminish their antithrombotic efficacy. Also, patients should be provided with a plan in the case of a missed dose. Second, bleeding risk assessment. For example, excessive alcohol use, NSAID use, and uncontrolled systolic blood pressure greater than 160 millimeters of mercury are important considerations. As well, concomitant use of acetyl salicylic acid increases the risk of bleeding in combination with DOAX by 30 to 60%. Let me clarify the earlier point. If the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure, is greater than 160 millimeters of mercury. Three, creatinine clearance. DOAX dosing declines with a reducing creatinine clearance. Therefore, the cockcroft gold equation should be used to determine if the dose of the DOAC is correct and the VMO or GP advised accordingly. Four, drug interaction assessment and education. Important classes of drugs that should prompt a more detailed assessment are anticonvulsant drugs, HIV drugs, TB medication, azole antifungals, transplant immunosuppressants, and macrolide antibiotics. Finally, the patient should be encouraged to monitor for hypertensive issues. Hypertension is the leading risk factor for intracranial hemorrhage. Orthostatic hypotension should also be monitored as an increased falls risk may cause an intracranial hemorrhage. To conclude, Data for VTE use of DOAX in the morbidly obese is sparse and conclusions are derived from PK and PD considerations. Currently, the best guidelines are those provided by the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis 2016. They recommend a standard DOAX dose in the management of VTE treatment and prevention in patients with a body mass index of less than or equal to 40 kilograms per meter squared and body weight less than or equal to 120 kilograms. They discourage direct use in morbidly obese patients with a BMI greater than 40 or a weight greater than 120 kilos. If the drug specific level is found to be below the expected range, it is recommended to change to a VKA rather than adjust the dose of the DOAC. Thank you for your attendance at this webinar. Thank you very much, John. That's great information, very detailed. For those watching this recording, as you can see, we don't have a Q&A, which we usually do for a live event, but we will do that in future. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this webcast recording. Please join us for our next live event on April 19, where we will discuss the use of probiotics in clinical practice. You can register to attend via our HPS website. 
John, are you open to receiving questions via a particular email account? Yes, certainly. Send, send it through the uh, HPS account. That's fine. Okay, wonderful. Um, and also, if you've got any questions about these webcast events, please email us at communications at hps.com.au. Thank you for watching and we'll see you soon.